Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome to this episode of Clay's Cortex, the podcast. Uh, super excited for this. We had some technical difficulties, a.k.a. I had some technical difficulties last week <laughs> with the internet and so forth. And um, yeah, and I guess it kind of carries over into this topic because I was asked by Tom and the person who is on this episode is Tom Purvis of Resistance Training Specialist or PersonalTrain.com. New one, ExerciseProfessional.com. So we'll talk about some of that stuff today, but really we're just going to talk about this topic of mastery or experts, but kind of just really just have a dialogue. We're going to let it go where it goes. And I think that was one thing that we, him and I caught up on FaceTime last week, which was great because it was just a conversation. And I think that a lot of us, you know, trainers, excess professionals need to have more of these conversations. So I'm going to actually be quiet a little bit right now and ask Tom, I'm going to introduce Tom and Tom, how you doing? You're doing a good job talking. I don't see any reason to say anything. You can answer for me because you got, you know, you got the radio voice going on, man. Oh man, the radio voice. You know, uh, yeah, maybe I'll switch careers. You should say welcome to W C L A Y, you know, or something like that. Tonight at ten o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> Do the Sunday, Sunday, Sunday thing. That would be good. Yes, that'd be really good. Cool, man. Yeah. So. Well, we didn't talk about a bunch of stuff last week, but I think one thing that was really interesting to me that I want to talk to you about and just wherever it goes, it goes was uh, this topic of like mastery, right? And, and uh, becoming an expert. Cause I think we're hearing a lot of that, those type of terms being thrown out. And I know you've talked about in your course and so forth um, about, you know, a master trainer and, but we're hearing this all the time. Uh, I got a funny story, but I'll, I'll pull it out later in the podcast. One of the guys here told me about something and I'd love to hear your reaction, but yeah, I mean, mastery, the reason why I thought of you is because when I was at your class and, you know, you talked about on the certification plaque and so forth, you talked about um, in there, it says, you know, you're never really a master. You're always refining, always trying to get better. And um, how important do you think that is, you know, for us as trainers or anybody always refining our process? <clears throat> You know what I want to say right off the bat is it's the most important thing. And I think I'm going to go with that. Um, and I'm going to go as far as to say in any profession, mm. and we could go a step further and say in life in general, there are very few masters. And the problem is, as you mentioned, people, you know, they want their black belt and then they think they've achieved something. And I, I would like to think that once somebody enters something like a martial art, the belt to some degree becomes an insignificant thing. And it's more about, can I continue to get better forever with whatever my body can tolerate at various decades of my life or whatever? Um, people who I don't know, love math. I mean, I, I, I don't ever hear of them just going, eh, I got my accounting degree and I'm good. <laughs> But, you know, they, if they love it and they're passionate about it, and, and, I'm, and the profession idea, um, you know, there are people that are master carpenters that aren't necessarily carpenters for the profession. Mm. But when it comes to our profession, <clears throat> um, anything where you're responsible for others, I'm going to say something extreme, but I feel like it's almost a crime <laughs> the way it's currently offered. And I'm going to even extend that to the medical world. There are a lot of doctors, it seems, it seems that I have known where once they get an MD behind their name, they think they're infallible and that like a congressman, you know, he was an idiot before he gets to Congress. And the second he gets there, he knows everything about everything. Right. But they, they start giving exercise advice. They start giving nutritional advice. They start doing all this stuff because they're an MD who studies something very specific. Right, right. And their general right. education, four years of medical school, does not teach them anything about exercise, as if that would even be correct in school anyway. So it's just funny how people extend based upon the crap behind their name and their their ego's belief that uh, in, 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 in extending their expertise to everything. Um, and that is the opposite of mastery. Right. I think that mastery is not just this lifelong passion for learning. And improving, there's a lot of people who I think interpret learning as, well, I'm going to read the newspaper and I'm going to be up on all the current events and I'm going to read textbooks. And it's like, you know, that's 50% of learning, but sitting on the toilet, reading shit on the internet does not make a master, except maybe <laughs> in wiping their ass. Okay. 
So really it's about what are you doing? Are you getting out there and trying to apply that? Are you seeing where it does and doesn't apply? Are you, and that doesn't happen much these days. I would like to blame it on millennials. I think it's just people in general, although there seems to be an, an abundance in a generation where everything has been so readily available to them. Mm-hmm. And the more you put in your head, you think you're smart and you can't, you know, people, they memorize stuff that's not intelligence. And schools pretty much demand, you know, you're an A student. If you memorize enough stuff, that doesn't mean you can solve a problem. Mm. So we see that with protocols and physical therapy. In my opinion, physical therapy, and I can talk about them because that's me. Um, that's it's right. gone downhill. Yeah. Totally gone downhill. I don't see problem solving. I see them looking for the next protocol, the next method, the next philosophy that can help their patient. It's like, look at the patient. Right. What might you try next? Screw the name of it. I hate acronyms. I hate names of things because as soon as people know, you know, they start, uh, you have a financial advisor and he starts throwing out acronyms. You're like, wait a minute, I'm going to give you $10,000. And I don't know a word you just said and because it's, you know, it's all acronyms. And, and it's so ridiculous for people to assume that someone outside of their profession or not even their profession, someone outside of their little tiny current interests could possibly know all your acronyms. And to use those is a lack of understanding communication. Communication to me is about explaining what you're getting ready to say, why you're saying it. Let me help clarify. If you really want it to be known what you're saying, I think people use acronyms because they're either clueless about communication or they want to show off like they know something. Yeah, man, and I, I agree. You, you get this idea in my mind of a master where I said one time when I was working with Cybex as a consultant, and I came out with VR2 in 1995. And I was working with what I thought was some really, and they were some really amazing people, both on the sales side and the guy who, uh, uh, the engineers that helped to refine it um, and industrially design it, the guy who actually created it, who was not an engineer, but he was brilliant. He's created lots of things in our industry. And I got up at the beginning, it was before URSA, where they were uh, introducing this. And I said, you know, it, it, it hits me as I get walking up here. All these guys that are currently involved in this company that ultimately disband, nothing lasts forever. I said, masters of anything make it look easy. Mm -hmm. Nobody gets the true skill of a master because it looks like you could do it too because they make it so easy. So you know what I'm talking about? You get somebody who could kill you with their little finger and you're going, (laughs) oh man, that looked easy. I could do that. It's like, no, we spent fucking 50 years learning how to learning how to do everything a more difficult way and getting so good at the difficult ways and refining it down to it's like, I can just look at you now and you're going to die, you know? And (laughs) I'm I'm, I'm doing my normal exaggeration thing, being stupid, but you get my point, right? You're shaking your head yes, so I'm assuming you know. No, I love it. I I, I never thought about that, right? The whole aspect of, you know, a master makes it look easy as if somebody else can do it, right? Like, oh, I can do that. I I, I never thought about that from that aspect. And that's actually really true. Like people that are really good at their, I guess you say craft or whatever it is, it's like just, it's almost like a part of them, right? It's just how they operate. But little do the people know, whatever profession, whatever it is, they're constantly thinking, huh, how can I make this better for this client? Wow, that went really good for the first couple reps. Whoa, that fatigued really fast. Or, you know what? They they can't really control that, say, dumbbell press. Let me move them to an incline, like a low incline, right? Because they've got that availability. But then all of a sudden, they're like, I don't really get there that much. And they don't tell you that. And all of a sudden, they're like, wow, that's actually really hard. Well, yeah, I mean, you're learning how to do that position now or movement. But I feel like a master, yeah, man, they make it almost look simple, but it's not. And I like the communication aspect you talk about because I think that's pretty crucial, right? I feel like people, and I'll use your term that I where I first heard it from, was sound bites. People use sound bites, and I feel like when people use those sound bites, it's to either sound intelligent, or per, or a persona, or on the surface, yeah, I'm intelligent. I know that word, right? Piriformis syndrome, or what, whatever the word may be, but it's like, what is? How is that building up your client to understand what you're trying to educate or talk them about during this session? It could be in that moment, you know. Well, sound bites, and there's several things you said there I'm going to try to address, uh, if I may. Sound you bites may. are annoying to me because of what, number one, what you said. Um, it's an attempt at being intelligence. They, they use this term without knowing what it means, or they use it, they use it as a justification for something, and mm-hmm. in and of itself, as if it's self-supporting. 
Okay. You remember I showed you, I, I don't know if you were in one of the classes, but I used to show that clip from a movie called Idiocracy. Yeah. And I love this one scene where it's a very circular, very in my world, exer exercise world argument where someone goes, uh, what was the thing? It's been so long since I've seen it. Um, what does she keep saying over and over? Dad gum it. Um, they're talking about the plants dying. Oh, and they're going to give her this Gatorade, Gatorade type stuff, right? Because yes. because somebody's the Gatorade stuff is all they drink now in the future, and so they're going to give whatever it's called to the plants. And and she goes because it has electrolytes, right? <laughs> and he goes, it's Luke Wilson. He goes, but what are electrolytes? He says it's what plants crave. He's like. And, it, and those are her only two answers. No matter what he asks, she keeps coming back with those sound bites. And, you know, it, it's, a, it's so people are going to go, oh, Tom loves this movie. No, it's a clip. And it's kind of funny if you understand the context. And that's what a sound bite is. And they go, like, to me, sound bites extend, extend to things that people are going to, they're going to they're think I'm nuts. But when someone says, oh, you've got tight this and weak that, that's a sound bite. They can't even support that. They have no idea. I can do, I can, I can totally prove them wrong simply by going hey can you pull your shoulders back and stand up straight oh look they can it's not that tight and it's not that weak is it there's 20 other possible things that could be affecting your posture but what it looks like right now is you're freaking lazy mm. and there's no amount of strengthening i can do to make you not lazy if it were true i could have you work your shoulder flexors for so long that when you wake up in the morning your arms sticking straight out like a hard on i mean think <laughs> about it it doesn't happen that way you have to choose to lift your arm no matter how strong you are and by that same a, a, a token, you know, the simple fact that what they're, they're watching somebody, the way they stand, they're going, oh, your pecs are tight, and your back's weak. Then we might as well be saying if your arm's hanging by your side, your delts are weak and your lats are tight because mm. your arm's hanging by your side. It's the same rationale. This is how hypocritical and how stupid we are in this industry and probably in the, and, and they let us vote. Explain that. <laughs> but anyway, so sound bites, sound bites are for the weak-minded, the immature minds, the people who want to feel like they're more than they are, and they can't talk about the topic any further than the three-word phrase or the ten-word sentence that they just spout out as if they know something. School, unfortunately, perpetuates that because right. that's right. as a test. So I can't blame that so much on people. I, I, I want to, and I shouldn't, because they've never seen an example of anything other than that. So I got to back off of that blame thing a little bit. But the other thing is, when people, you're going back, to, I want to go back to the dumbbell press you were talking about. It's a reasonable example, because it requires more control than something, than a machine, maybe. But machines also require control, and most people don't understand machines, and most machines are built poorly these days. Right. So even if they had one, it wouldn't be appropriate. If they had one, they wouldn't know how to use it because they think, oh, just shove. Well, there's no just shove in that stuff. There's a lot to own. And you go to this dumbbell press, and the simple fact, you know this, Curtis, that the weight went up and down. This guy thinks, hey, they got it. They got it figured out. Let me start counting now. It's like in my world, you don't start counting because it's going to take probably a month of motor learning and if you got someone that's 70 and you think the dumbbell press is a chest exercise for them, it's not. No. It's not. They will never learn it well enough where learning becomes not the challenge. They will never learn it well enough to where the load could actually be the challenge. But we think the exercise creates the response. It is Ooh. how we execute the exercise that generates the response. You can't just – listen, you're a baseball kid, right? You can't just grab a baseball and throw it towards the guy with the wooden thing and, and, and call yourself a fucking pitcher, right? Sorry, you don't like those words, but it pisses me off. You know what I'm saying? Oh, and yes. I know, I know you know exactly what I'm saying. I shouldn't. I think what's that. interesting okay. to me is that, uh, you know, oh, gosh, I mean, that's another tangent we can go on. Not really tangent, but like you said essentially, hey, that movement essentially, it the, we can never get to the part where the weight or the load is the challenge, right? The motor some learning people, aspect. Some people, right. For sure, man. And I, I'm not going to disagree with that. I obviously agree with that. I think what's interesting, though, is I'm seeing social media, people have discussions with me, well, you need to elicit a physiological response. And if they don't do their form right, then they're not going to elicit that. And I'm like, well, have you thought about, hey, where do you feel that? If you're doing, and you see it a lot with like youth athletes. I have youth athletes come in all the time. And obviously, I work with, I like a, interesting discrepancy like i have some parents and adults that want to train they you know recovering from injuries and stuff 
I get a lot of youth athletes, which is interesting to change their perspective and how they view exercise and how their coaches um, explain it and how to use it. You just got to crush these kids. I'm like, you want to crush them? Okay, what are you, what are they, a soda can? I mean, what, what, are, you, what are you talking about? And then I get, everybody's in the military. <laughs> That's the lunacy of boot camps because the purpose of a boot camp in the military is not to get you in shape. It's to weed you out. Yes. So how do yes. I use that? That's a facade. And it's the same type of thing. We got to get them in and we got to break them down. Okay. Breaking them down by definition is not good. Oh, but you have to tear muscle down for it to build up. It's like, okay, another sound bite. Totally <laughs> wrong. I love oh, it. Oh, listen to this. Talk about another tangent. There was a, a guy that I knew, a doctor. That's irrelevant. But he could quote research. And these guys think everything's going to be proven by research. When in fact, research proves very little, if nothing, relative to exercise. Okay. Because the more you can't control the variables. And if you did, it wouldn't apply to everybody else doing the exercise. So the thing is, he was like, well, we know now that there's micro tears in muscle after exercise. And that's how it changes and develops and builds and gets better and stronger and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, and I went, dude, how do you know? that the way these college students were asked to perform the exercise or the way they randomly performed the exercise was the best way to do it. I'm not saying they didn't produce tears. I'm saying, how do you know the tears were a positive byproduct or response mm. to the exercise? It just happened. It happened. I'm not denying that. You, and also, did you check to see if the tears were already there? Because if you didn't do a baseline before that biopsy, then you don't know what was there ahead of time. There's all kinds of problems problems with that assumption, but what we hear in the exercise world is some idiot on social media going, <laughs> well, obviously, you're supposed to tear muscle because we did they did exercises and, and things were torn, so it's good. It's like, what are you talking about? That's like saying, man, I got in this awesome car wreck. I want to be so much more ready for the next one. I mean, <laughs> you know? No, I, I hear you. I think it's just interesting because it's like... <sighs> I mean, okay. Is, I mean, there's no, but us as humans, we we tend to like to make things easy, right? We want to make things easier. Like, you know, I tried, you know, like quote, quote, you know, learned helplessness, right? Like, I tried 80 percent. If I would tried 100 percent, I could execute it. It's like, well, wait a second. Stop going through the motions, and understand how to lock that person in. Understand how to build this out for them. Understand that just throwing out this research, that's that's not for this person sitting in front of you. Could you And have if they that? knew what they were looking for, it would be obvious to them. Thank you. But they don't know what they're looking for. So again, the fact the weight's moving, they can start counting. When, again, the person hasn't done one. And it's really funny when you get to the research about, oh, we took 30 guys, we did a bench press, blah, 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 blah. I'm like, okay, but your little scheme or whatever you're trying to prove or whatever you tested, you know, you can just teach them the movement with a freaking – two, three pound weights in their hand, hands. And, and if, as they improve in skill, their strength is going to go up independent of any muscular stuff. Yeah. And the, the thing is that they often go. So I'm, I'm like, well, we should teach them for a month or two or forget time. Cause people go, well, how many weeks do you think it takes to learn a bench press? It's like, you know, I'll just look at them and tell you when they're pretty darn good. And I don't care if it's a day for some people who are really, who own their body and are innately skilled. Mm -hmm. And then there's other people who will never get it. They always look like crap. And it's so funny that these people, oh, no, no, no. We spent an hour teaching them how to do it beforehand. It's like, then you didn't teach it. You introduced it, right? That's the dumbest right. thing. That's like literally saying people, people don't get the level of skill involved in even a leg extension. And people right now have all kinds of emotional reactions to leg extension because they simply don't understand them. And right. I'm not saying everybody should do them. I'm saying it's a tool. It's like a three eighths wrench. And when I need it, nothing else works the same. It's just the way it is. And we can get rid of our biases and grow up right now. But um, this, this teaching of how to do things is the key. And it is, it exists in everything except our world, right? You don't, they didn't take Usain Bolt and say, all right, kid, you've never run before, but go as fast as you can and we'll fix stuff along the way. They don't do that. They don't take pictures and just say, okay, try to throw 90 and we'll worry about accuracy later. Right. Nothing. Right. They don't take someone that's, that's in vocal training for the opera and say, just sing as loud as you can and we'll try to hit some notes later. I mean, come on. We do it the opposite in this world because we over – we overestimate the simplicity. We underestimate the skill requirements. I like that. Because we live in this dumbass, just do it world. 
and we live in a superficial world in exercise. We're watching, as we've said in class, weight move and skin move, and we think we're good, and it's wrong. Right. I mean, the funny thing is with that, for example, too, say uh, uh, there's I, I talked to a kid that came in this week. We did the sit down consultation, you know, if they want to go through the process and kind of get going. And uh, they're like, yeah, I hurt my back doing lifting, you know, and I was like, well, how, you know, what were you doing? He's like, well, I was doing a deadlift. I'm like, OK, this kid was like six, four legs for days. I'm like, well, did, how, the, how did you deadlift? Well, you do a deadlift. You're supposed to do a deadlift from the floor. And you do it from the floor, and you know that's how I was doing it. I'm like, okay, I'm like, dude, I, and I'm like, I haven't looked at you, I haven't checked how you move. We're just sitting talking. Your parents are here. I'm having a tough time thinking that you should even start with a deadlift. I'm having a tough time even thinking you should start from the floor. And they're like, well, what do you mean? You're supposed to do a deadlift from the floor? No, that's just choreographed exercise based off of the masses saying it's supposed to be done like this. There's it, one group of people whose sport demands that because it's part of the rules. And what is a basketball player or even a football player, anybody else? And if you want it, this is the, this is the again, hypocrisy for a basketball player. If this kid's six, six or whatever the heck, you'll never jump with your ass on the floor. Thank you. You don't <laughs> jump from there. So if you want to play the functional game where something needs to look like something, and I'm not saying that's the way it is, right. but they're violating their own rules because there's not a single thing they'll ever do that looks like it. So here's the thing. We could play the game. Yes. Why is he going that low? Number one, why doesn't he just use the bar? Forget the amount of weight. Let's work on this forever. And as he goes up in weight, we're going to have to relearn it. That's what they don't get also is they, they learn it with a certain weight. And as they get stronger, there's a new motor challenge there. It's not just moving it. It's relearning the skill of it to some degree because the purpose of the weight is to deteriorate you in terms of skill. It's to make it harder. And, and so you got to be super locked in across years. What does powerlifting have to do with that? Nothing. Could this kid go to the floor? Maybe, but why would he even pretend to use a super maximally challenging weight there? So we could do something from the floor that was appropriate for him, even in terms of non-challenging load, working on the skill of control there, go to something that doesn't go to the floor, put the, put the bars in a squat rack or whatever the heck. Yeah. And yeah. then do even shorter ones that are heavier, you know, and they've got names for those and they're always Eastern Bloc things. There's the Romanian <laughs> thing and the Turkish thing and the Lebanese thing. The Lebanese thing always comes with good food, though, so that's OK. But, you know. I agree, man. I think it's interesting. And I like, but like if we go back to that topic of like, yeah, you know, say you do the bar, you add a little bit of load. That's a whole new experience. That's it a is. whole new experience for them. And I think what's interesting is me as a, as a trainer, you know, what, whatever title, somebody that uses exercise to help people's bodies function better, whatever it may be, you know, I have had to get better and better at my thinking process of like, whoa, that's not a good option right now. That is a good option. Okay, let's do as many things as we can, checking you out to see how you're moving. Do you have that range of motion available to then build the exercise for the person? And I'll never forget when I went to class, man. I was like, man, this is, there's so much to think about. There's so much that they're leaning on me for, for guidance, right? And then getting them to understand why I'm doing something. That's helped me become that much better at what I do is if I can explain why I'm doing something, right? You know, then, then it's like, okay, I understand that versus just like, oh my gosh, I'm put on the spot. Uh, yeah, because it's functional or, you know, I don't, you know, whatever, so whatever three things. Is. Yeah. Cause because it's functional is not only <laughs> typically wrong, it's just another stupid soundbite. But the thing is, because there's what nine different nine definitions of the term functional. And so the assumption that anybody's on the same page or that it would even be accurate if we were on the same page is something else. But something you said that was really important. I'm going to back up through them. I think in reverse order, Love it. you mentioned right. you're going to explain this to the people while you're doing this. And a master would explain it in words they could understand, right? Thank you're not going to go, now we do this abduction thing because blah, blah, blah. And it's like, abduction? You mean you're going to steal my kids? You know? So, you know, like we got to use, use words they understand. And then also, think about this. Um, you, mentioned, you mentioned a process. You didn't use that term, I don't think. But I, I can't do that range yet. We have in our world... Again, this superficial world where we don't know what we're looking at and we don't know what we're looking for as soon as, but you got to do full range of motion. No, you don't. Number one, define full range of motion for a specific right. person for a specific activity. It's not something you can predetermine. It comes with the individual and their skill level. So number one, there's nothing. 
that you have to do today. Everything we should progress up to. What you hope to do, you may not actually get to try to do for a long time. Right. And people don't get that. So we're going to start with deadlifts. And here's how you do a deadlift. It's like, no, you don't. You've got to be able to own your spine. You've got to be able to own your hips. You have to have all these pieces. I'm sorry, but integration by definition means you got to have the freaking pieces. Mm-hmm. And then you've got to learn the skill of putting those things together. So they don't even know the steps in a process. They throw the end result at people like, well, you know, our goal is to do a 600-pound bench press. So let's start with that because, you know, (laughs) the world's going, we would never do that. But in essence, that's a fair analogy. Could you start with a range they can't own? You don't even know. You don't even know what their personal range is. Oh, but a bench press goes to the chest. For who? Again, for a power lifter. Did you check this guy's actual range? He's got a rib cage that's thinner than a piece of paper, and his arms extend from here it's like Beetlejuice where he unrolls his arms, you know, <laughs> and so this kid needs to bench press to his chest. And by the way, if, if millennials don't know what Beetlejuice is, I'm sorry, but you need to get a movie-cation, okay? Uh, movie-cation. And so the other thing is you're talking about the first thing you mentioned or that we were both discussing was this idea of keep revisiting the skill acquisition as we go up and challenge. And I'm going to give you what might be a fair example of that is um, – and people always struggle, as you as you know. You you probably get it. When I use a lot, I use a lot of analogies outside of exercise because I think it makes people wake up. Most people are so bad at analogies that they are like, "Wait a minute, we're not talking about cars." But right now, I'm gonna use a car as that example. So you're 16 and you learn to drive, and you're pretty darn darn good at driving within the speed limit and staying within the lines. Does that mean? that I can put you in the Indy 500 or Le Mans race or something, and you're going to be able to control a car at 200 freaking miles an hour. How long do they spend learning how to deal with the intimate detailed control of a car at 200 miles an hour? That's a totally different thing than driving your dumb ass to the, you know, ice cream shop. So <laughs> there's a great example. So, you know, someone learning to jog rarely mistake, mis- rarely mistakes himself for a marathon runner and certainly doesn't mistake himself for a world-class sprinter. And the number of things, it's not just about trying to run faster with your current ineptitude. It's about getting better at the skill with every fraction of an increase in speed. And there are, are, you watch really high level college coaches say, whoa, 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 slow down there. You got to go back and work on this. You're missing this thing here, right? Right. We don't do that in the exercise world. We don't back up to fill in the steps. We just go, you know, head first into the wall. Right. They just keep going, right? They just they just keep going. It's like, oh, okay, well, that's good enough. What's good enough? That's good enough. Let's add some more load. That's good enough. Let's add a different movement. It's like, wait a second here. And I don't care if a trainer does that to themselves. I absolutely don't care. I'm not codependent. Do anything you want to yourself. But when you accept the responsibility for someone else, what you do to and for yourself becomes irrelevant. Yep, it's not yep. to have some experiences, but doing it for 20 years does not generate experience. And here's part of that mastery thing again to circle yes. back is someone does something for 20 years and they're like, oh, I've been doing this for 20. Actually, it's a big now. And there's these kids that think they're really cool and they're online. I've been doing this for 10 years. I'm like, well, in about 40, you might pull your head out. Because <laughs> right now what I see is the thing you did for a month, you're repeating every month for 10 years. You have zero experience except you've reinforced crap. Right. That is not, you know, when they say, and you've, you've seen this on my wall, practice doesn't make perfect. Perfect practice makes perfect. Right. And that's a Vince Lombardi thing or something, but it's so true. And the problem is going back again to the, one of the keys to mastery to me is constantly asking, what am I missing? What can I improve? Constantly, never one day riding on your laurels, never once saying anything's good enough to your point you just made. Constantly going, and this does not mean, this is different than insecurity. I've known people that come to class, and you're right, there's like a lot of stuff, and they go, oh, I don't even feel like I can train anybody anymore. I don't even know what to do. It's like, well, you dive in, and that's how you come to know how to use to make decisions. So asking yourself, what am I missing, is not about being insecure. You have to use what you currently know cautiously, seeing where it doesn't work. And just because it didn't work on this person today doesn't mean it won't work with them tomorrow. And it doesn't mean it won't work immediately with somebody else and never with yet a third person. But being open to these things is what makes a master. Constantly looking at what am I missing right here with this person? Not what am I missing in a textbook? While that may be important at some point, what's going on here that 
and here's where the sound bites come in. Oh, well, because you uh, can't squat, you always obviously have uh, uh, tight plantar flexors because you can't dorsiflex enough. And they got all these immediate answers. As soon as someone thinks they have an answer, as soon as they plug them in to a predetermined answer, that person is officially a freaking idiot. Mm, mm. There's mastery as possible, as far as possible. That doesn't mean they can't redeem themselves because all they have to do is start asking, well, I've got this sound bite that makes me feel all comfortable. It makes me feel smart. I really love that. But what am I missing? Right. I, I think asking those questions and refining yourself and really how you're making decisions. And sometimes you just need to shut up. I mean, let's be real. Hey, how was that? How did that feel? Where'd you feel that? Right? Like, Asking these questions, slowing down, like, oh, wow, that's based off the line of force. I wouldn't expect them to feel that there. Well, okay, well, at what portion of that movement? What are you struggling with? Are you struggling? To me, it looks like you're struggling contracting and moving versus you're just trying to move with any means possible. Yes. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's so guy the other day that one of, my, one of my trainers, not my trainers, one of the guys who works out of my place was uh, working with, and this guy, this is a, he's a lawyer, and he's – into this man he trains hard and they were working on deadlifts and from a specific range that appeared to be appropriate for him now and maybe forever because his goal was never powerlifting it's to improve his body he doesn't even care about the weights he cares about working hard and that's cool right yeah. but in an attempt to work hard we started noticing that on the last few reps of his deadlifts and by the way we don't count reps we just start noticing it's getting hard enough that he can't do it anymore and when he can't lift it for him He's progressed to the point where he can go that far and he's done. Okay, great. So how many reps is that? Who the hell knows? <laughs> so the thing is, um, you started noticing this thing you were saying where things were falling apart. His, his spine started giving a little bit. And it was two things. If you're paying attention, not you, not me, but anybody, it happened in two places. It happened as he was getting near the bottom because when you get tired, you stop lowering yourself and you start lowering the bar. So he was trying to reach for the bottom with the bar, which means if he's not lowering his ass, something else is right. Mm -hmm. And then the same thing on the way up. He started moving himself before the bar started coming up. So it's like, and here's where this all came down to. You can explain, 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 explain. But when you start recognizing what you and I talk about in class, which is simply this, there's a relationship in this example don't turn this into a soundbite, Mr. Listener out there. <laughs> but scapular retraction is intimately related with spinal extension. And if the scapula gravitate, no pun intended, away to, from retraction into protraction, the thoracic spine soon follows, the lumbar spine soon follows, and you can say keep your back straight and all these stupid soundbite cues all you want to, but you got to go what for him was for the source, and number one is – Stop trying to reach the bottom with the weight. Mm. Focus on your scapula for now, not forever, but let's see what happens. Let's see if this is what we were missing. And when he started focusing on now, how much was he retracting? I don't know, man, enough to do what we were asking from. You know, what, what were we asking? Is he fully retracted? He's like, you know, there's it, get off the numbers. Get off the easy answers. You have to look and see. You have to watch and see. And if the words I say to him don't do it, I got to rethink the words and go, try to think about this. Maybe close your eyes. Maybe, I don't know. I don't know. I love you got to have a person in front of you. But when he started work, when you get to the bottom, focus on keeping the chest up and the shoulders back. Right then where it's falling apart. And right then when you're starting the next rep. Now, he didn't have any trouble with that throughout the rest of the thing. So getting him to focus on it primarily at those places, and it completely changed the outcome the motor outcome of what was going on. For because sure. in my opinion, that weight appeared to be too heavy or he was doing too many reps because it was falling apart. But I know I've watched him progress and I know he has the strength and I know he has the internal awareness to find those positions. He just, when getting tired, didn't know to focus on that primarily. So, but how do we know that? Because right now someone's going, oh, I'm going to remember that. And they're going to use that cue on everybody, right. whether they need it or not, or whether they're ready for it or not. And that is not mastery. That is not RTS. It is about what do you see? you got to know what you're looking for and what you're looking at. And you cannot get that from a book. And you cannot get that from listening to us. When we give a specific example like that, what we're saying is start trying you got to understand what it takes to accomplish this stuff and the bar moving is somewhat irrelevant right the, i mean the, the, exactly. the engine 
The engine and the transmission have to be full blast, in control, and awesome. Your alignment of your wheels needs to be really good if you want to keep this thing on the road. And then, then you, you might get enough skill to go to the Indy 500. But all, all these things come first, and there's no that's, way around that. That takes a long time. I mean, it takes anything, a I, long time. You know, and so it's like understanding that, right? Like, if you think about, I mean, we're talking about mastery and all that kind of stuff, but it's a process, and you're always progressing. That's why you're like, oh, my gosh, this client's owning this. They've got control of this. They've got, hey, you know how you said you wanted to, I know we've been saying deadlift. You wanted to deadlift? I think you might be ready. You're owning this. You're doing this. How you been feeling? Like, okay, let's go try it out. And then that's a whole new experience of learning. But that's the thing is I feel like we just rush into it. You know, like it, that's not mastery. And sometimes the thing is, is we think, oh, well, this, this word, these, this communication, I say to 80%. Now I'm just saying, man, lately this week, lately this week, this cue has been working with everybody. So I'm just going to keep hammering this down. Then you get somebody that comes in that's like, you want me to what? Has no clue. Are you just going to keep saying it over and over again? Kind of like you said, electrolytes. They're electrolytes. Yeah. You're just going to keep hammering it, or are you going to be like, okay, hold, give me a second. Okay. What I want you to think about, instead of holding those back, get everything set, uh, push your feet through the ground or whatever, whatever yes. it is that changes. And so much of that comes, this is where your own experiences start to come into play because you might, you can't just, I don't think you can just randomly start throwing cues at people. You right. have to have explored cues yourself. That's your homework. That's the true 20 years of experience. You, if you've done it the same way, if you use the same cue in your mind all the time, you have no arsenal for people mm -hmm. who cannot do it. You have to see how these things affect how your intention your attempt at shoving through the ground totally changes the way it quote unquote feels and maybe the orthopedic outcome. And there's a couple more things that you, listen, someone said one time, a friend was telling me, I wish we could find on the internet where someone said, Hey, listen, you should fitness is a training is a great profession to get into because anybody can do it because the bar is so low to enter the profession. Right. So here's the problem. We think we know how because we kind of sort of did it like we think we could be computer programmers because we played a freaking video game on our laptop <laughs> one time. OK, so we love easy. We love the feeling that we are something despite having done something incredibly easy. Right. Well, I'm this now. Yeah, but you didn't do anything to earn it. It's like all the online online coaching stuff now. Online coaching. Yeah, well, I, number one, I don't think you can train anybody online without two things. Knowing what we're talking about so you can watch them. Ideally, you worked with them before, and right. you know some of their tendencies and stuff. You've seen them in three-dimensional space. You've watched in three dimensions. So you know them well enough that when you're kind of watching them on the Zoom or whatever, you can go, now, remember we talked about this. You're doing that little thing again. Be careful with that. I can't imagine somebody paying somebody else to say, okay, now bench press one, two. It's like, you know, I, when my daughter was three, she could count higher than most trainers. So I don't know why I was hoping that anybody would pay anyone. Your horses can count. You know, you know, you've seen that. So it's just ridiculous. And we love to get something for nothing. We love titles back to that idea again. Mm. Well, I'm a certified online trainer. You know what you just said? You're a certified idiot. You bought into that thing. You put a title behind your name that's actually embarrassing. Mm. And you think it's something. It's embarrassing to a profession. It's literally, it would be, I don't know. I can't even think of a comparable analogy where something that should be respected, something that we don't even, the world doesn't even know how much it should be in order to attain this thing, because what we learn in school does nothing, really, mm. honestly. You can learn about a mitochondria all you want to. It doesn't tell you how to, someone should exercise. Somebody can show you how to do power lifts, and that doesn't mean it has anything to do with the 70-year-old who's got rotator cuff stuff and all this other junk. Right. And by the way, those are the people that often have the money to and the time to train, right? And we don't we don't know anything, so we do our canned assessments and have somebody jump up on a bench and he had a hip replacement, and so I fell and broke his leg. And you're going, oh, that's that never happens. There's no, it happened here in my town at Gold Gym. Oh, and, man. Uh, yeah. But to to to. To be this person we're talking about, to enter the realm of 
starting a mastery road, this long, unending road. It's never a cul-de-sac. There's never a finish line. Requires, number one, being humble. And number two, taking responsibility. Love it. Here's the worst thing that I ever heard of. Now, I've heard of a lot of worse things. So just put this on the list of all with all the others. So uh, <laughs> a friend of mine was training out of a big place in Chicago where there are probably 50 trainers in this place. And I think it was just open for trainers. And he was watching some kid working with two relatively heavy, relatively young ladies, probably in their mid-20s. And he had them jumping over cones. These girls probably weighed 250 pounds. And he has them jumping. Like, that's the smartest thing. The best way to lose weight is impact on their knees. One of them slips and falls. And you know what he says? Not, I'm sorry. He doesn't probably think in his head, oh, my God, why am I having to do this? He goes, what did you do? Almost laughing. I, if I saw these kinds of things, Curtis, you'd have to come visit me in the state penitentiary. <laughs> I'd kill somebody. Yeah, it's, that's the hard part, right? And I think, I mean, I, dude, we, we should do another episode, too. Like, we should do another episode. But I'm thinking, like, essentially, that's not mastery, right? Like, you're essentially choreographing movements. Yeah, you're just choreographing movements. There's nothing spe- specific to the person. There's nothing meeting their demands. They want to lose weight. You're telling me that plyometrics are the best option? There's so many options. But the thing is, is for you to take a step back and think, hmm, can I do this better? Is this the best way to go about it? Well, you know why? They're going to say yes. You know why? Because the research says that when you do fast movements or explosive movements, that does this to your nervous system and blah, 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 blah. Never, ever, ever, ever does research or these unprofessional trainers, never do they ask, but who are we talking about here? I'm betting that wasn't a bunch of 60-year-olds in this research. I'm betting, and if it was, is there a skill level? Is there a height level? Could I have them jumping over a matchbook first? And of course, nobody knows what a matchbook is these days. Um, But is there any progression to this? especially skills of skill to jumping. Again, it's not just how high. And oh my gosh, take a look at the person and realize that, man, they used to do this on The Biggest Loser all the time. Their whole point was to have huge people and do stuff with them. And I watched, they would have them jump. They would have them, they would have, I saw this one where that idiot Michael's chick was uh, having a, a, a really heavy lady straddle the treadmill, she pumped the treadmill up to like 20 miles an hour and said, okay, jump on. And I'm like, what is this? It's like throwing a piece of wood on a sander. She's going to go shooting out the back. You know what right. I'm saying? What kind of time? And you know what? The problem is if you did it right on The Biggest Loser, it'd be the worst TV in yeah. the world. Just be like, man, we're watching the paint dry here. What are you doing? Well, we're trying to teach. We're trying to build the things that are required in order to eventually do that when she gets down to 120 ish pounds and she's not killing her joints. Yeah. So she gets to that goal weight or they get to that goal weight and they're like, ma'am, I'm freaking hurting everywhere. It's like, I had two guys that came home from there. They were twins. And some people might remember, Oh, I was so long ago, but, um, we know once someone gets kicked off the show, they have this thing called the biggest home loser where they come home and they're supposed to work out and they go back. And that's a kind of a secondary contest. Yeah. So these guys, they were both, they were both uh, police officers and they had been heavy their whole lives. Twins, like I said, and, uh, well, that'd be weird if you got pulled over by both of them at the same time. And you think, man, I didn't drink that much. Look at this. There's, I see two of these guys. So, um, but yeah, and they both, they both, went to an orthopedist right when they got home and they both, he said, you guys should have surgery next week on your knees. They were heavy and they were doing all this stuff, but you know what they did? They're so mesmerized, so adrenaline filled, so focused on this goal. They took off work for six weeks to run, to to keep working out eight hours a day. Now, what do you think happens to somebody when number one, they're sequestered from their family and all their previous lifestyle, so they, you know, there's no bad right. temptations. Right. Number two, they're doing crap eight hours a day, which is not even possible to sustain phys- physically, orthopedically, or in real life because there's mm-hmm. things called money requirements. So everybody gains the weight back because none of this is sustainable, but it's all so they can sell advertising. This mm-hmm. is a crime. 
I feel you, man. I feel you, man. Well, dude, I th- dude, we covered a lot. We covered a lot. I think I, if you're up for it, I'm up to do a part two and kind of keep going and see where that goes to. I think this was great because it was just a discussion. Um, but mastery, it's a, it's a skill of each of us as trainers. It's a skill from the aspect of training people. It's a skill from many different aspects. And we're trying to help our clients master these things also, which is a journey. It's not a sprint. It's a marathon. So, yeah, dude. If, I mean, if you're up for it, we should do a part two and just keep rolling. I thought this was good. We, we totally should. I'll do it anytime. We can do a part 85 if you want to. You know, they're going to have uh, – when the uh, guys in the expendables get in the nursing home, they're going to have a badass, you know, part 35, the wheelchair episode. Um, but two, I want to leave your folks with a couple yeah. things. Go back yeah. to the idea of being humble. And by that, I don't mean – I want to clarify because what everybody has a different version of what that word means. You have a person that pops up in your head of somebody that was humble. You think of a professional athlete going, well, I want to thank the team and blah, blah, blah. And that's cool, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about don't, don't ever think you know something. Don't ever allow your identity to be wrapped up in what you think you know, because you never know enough. Never. I love it. Got to be humble in terms of what you know. Got to always ask in that, in that regard, what am I missing? And here's the problem with that question. We are so uncomfortable when there's no immediate answer. That's where the sound bites come in. That's where following the idiots on social media come in. You have to be comfortable when you say, what am I missing? To sit back and go, to find that answer, I have to get better at observing. And we talk about in class, you've got to get to where you micro-observe, but that does not mean you immediately micromanage. Because when you start micromanaging, throwing everything at somebody, that's not progression. Progression requires them understanding your words. It requires them being able to do the simple things so you can get to the detailed things you see. There's a triage there of what matters most now versus here's what I want to see, but I have to earn the right. They have to earn the ability to get to this thing I want to see. There's a responsibility to do that because this is not just us looking like badasses and making people tired. It's not about generating sweat. All that stuff... Saying that it's about getting tired and saying it's about sweating is like saying the reason I eat is so I can take a shit. (laughs) That's just stuff that happens when you do the stuff you're supposed to do. You follow me? So we're using the wrong guidelines. And I know you're going to edit this as you probably should. Uh, It'd be funny if you didn't, but people would get offended. Um, (laughs) So this idea that when we go, what am I missing? We want an immediate answer. We want an immediate answer. And here's something I was going to say way back in the beginning. People come to class and... I used to, as you know, I would, I would bring up things that I thought were dumb. Can you believe we do this in the industry? And people will sit in class sometimes and go, man, I can't believe that. And I'm like, yes, I'm, they understand what I'm saying. Now, you would be one of the few people who would go, well, I, I, I'm not disagreeing with you, Tom, but what do you see in that that's not right? Hmm. And I started asking people in class, if I told you this was a terrible part of the industry, Do you know why I would say that? Do you see anything good or bad about this? Do you Mm. see anything potentially dangerous for somebody? Tell me what you see. And they often can't yet think deep enough. So I have to be really careful now. I have to not give them the answer. When we sit there and analyze equipment, and I'm going, there's this, there's this, there's this. Some people get really good at repeating it. But then when we move on to something else, they're like, crickets chirping. Nothing comes out because they didn't learn it. They, and it's the same thing with all these principles, right? I, it, it becomes important not to ask somebody a question to, to embarrass them, but to, to develop thought, to stimulate thought. What do you currently know you're in your head that you can start to create a rationale? What do you, so going back to what you see, there's not going to be any immediate answer. The most immediate thing is asking the question and never letting go of that question But pay attention and you will start to see things. Some things will matter more than other things. This is the process. The more we need the security of immediate answers, the more often those answers will be blatantly wrong. Hey, it's true, though. Hey, man, I love you. You're going to have to cut me off here. Otherwise, I'll be here all day long by myself talking about this stuff. You'll be off training people. I love it. Hey, man. Well, hey, I'll call you soon. We'll set up another time. And I just I did just want to say thank you for this episode. I think it's gonna be very informative for people to listen and understand the aspects of what, you know, from our perspective, what it looks like for mastery, especially within our industry. So I really appreciate your time, dude. Yep. Thank you very much. Yes. It's good hey, to talk I, to you. 
Yes, this is Curtis Clay, and this is Tom Purvis signing out. We will see you guys soon. Have a good one. Guys. <laughs>